Graham McQueen is a retired professor of religious studies at McMaster University, Ontario, where he taught from 1974 to 2003. He was also the founder of the former director of the Center for Peace Studies at McMaster. He is co-editor of the Journal of 9-11 Studies, and he's also a member of the Lawyers Committee Anthrax Committee. He did a, a very important book on domestic terrorism. And uh, thank you for being here, Graham. Sorry for uh, putting <laughs> Corbett, James Corbett ahead of you. That was my fault. I, I uh, didn't, didn't look close enough. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the introduction, David, and I uh, I don't mind being confused with James Corbett. <laughs> James is a great guy, so we'll hear from him soon. Um, it's an honor to be with you all uh, at this solemn event um, on a solemn occasion as we remember the thousands of people murdered 20 years ago. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about that event and one specific aspect of it, namely eyewitnesses who perceived explosions at the Twin Towers during their destruction. Um, I can be more specific than that because the first article ever I ever wrote on 9-11 was published 15 years ago and it was on eyewitnesses to explosions. I'm not going to redo that. I'm talking here today about TV reporters and what they witnessed on the ground next to the Twin Towers on 9-11. More specifically, what percentage of them seem to have seen or heard explosions at the time of the destruction of the towers? And there's a second question, and that is, if a lot of them actually did witness explosions, what happened to that hypothesis? How come the structural failure hypothesis quickly took over? I should say that this research has been done over the last couple of years with Ted Walter, from Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. And I thank Ted for his enthusiasm and his energy and his hard work, without which none of this would have happened. Before I proceed, I want to just clarify one thing which I often forget to, to talk about, and that is that a lot of people uh, think that the main, main um, story of 9-11 includes explosions. They'll say, oh, back when the World Trade Center was bombed, blah, blah, blah. Or back when they blew up the World Trade Center, blah, blah, blah. And they're not dissidents. They think that's the main story, the mainstream story. Well, it isn't, okay? So just, just to clarify this, the mainstream story has no room for bombs or explosions at all. Uh, it's not about that. It says that the... Uh, Planes hit the towers, and through a combination of fire and structural weakening, the towers came down. And it's quite distinct from explosions. So when I talk about people witnessing explosions, this is a big deal. Because if they're right, something's wrong with the mainstream story. Now, before I proceed any further, I thought it might be useful to get in touch with what it was like to be on the ground at the World Trade Center as a reporter on that day. So, Alan, if we're able to play that video, that would be a good time. But as I was looking up, I saw the entire explosion. It looked exactly like the first two, but we certainly had the most perfect vantage point for that explosion. It was unbelievable. And there has just been a huge explosion. We can see uh, a billowing smoke rising. And I can't, I'll, I'll tell you that I can't see that second tower. We're not sure exactly what happened, but it was another explosion on the far side of one of the buildings from where we're standing. The, ver the, the reverberation and another explosion on the right-hand side. Watch the right it's side. exploding. On the far side of the building, there seemed to be another explosion, and also on the right-hand side. There was also another explosion. We're not sure if that was uh, extra reverberation from what happened at the World Trade Center or if that was an added explosion. We heard a very loud blast and explosion. We looked up and the uh, building literally began to collapse before us. Uh, again, there has been a second explosion uh, here in uh, Manhattan at the, at the Trade Center. We are... And uh, believe it or not, there was another major explosion. The, build, the building itself Literally, the top of it came down, sending smoke and debris everywhere. Do you know if it was an explosion or if it was a building collapse? To me, it sounded like it, it, to me it sounded like an explosion, a huge explosion, a huge rumbling cloud. We're taking photographs and securing this area just prior to that 
huge explosion that we all heard and felt. But it literally exploded and came down as though it had been hit. We heard an explosion. The explosion happened with shooting pieces of the plane. There are pieces of the plane on Church Street. Uh, there's another explosion as we speak. Something either exploded or fell off the side of the one building that was attacked. Then the entire top of the building just blew up. Just seconds ago there was a huge explosion and it appears right now the second World Trade Tower has just collapsed. Um, it was just a, a small explosion and then rocks and debris and everything started pouring down. And we were about two blocks away when the, the second explosion hit and all we heard was just this small explosion then you saw a, a roar of an, of an explosion and uh, all kinds of smoke coming billowing out, debris falling down. It, it's unbelievable because you, you hear these explosions. In fact, I just heard another one, uh, I don't know if it was like an after effect or whatnot, just while you were on the phone talking about the school closing. I and also... I'm hearing another explosion, just so oh. you know. I'm hearing another rumble. It's, what you can feel when these tremors come is that it literally comes up under your feet. That's what it feels like. I, that's the best way I know to describe it certainly didn't imagine that there would be second or tertiary explosions, so they parked some of their vehicles in those areas, and many of those vehicles, people in those vehicles, have lost their lives. Well, we just heard another explosion go off a couple of minutes ago, Chris, and uh, saw a bunch more people sort of running this way. A woman on her bike was, was screaming as it went off, and uh, there was a, a New York City uh, officer, he's playing clothes, walking by with a radio. I tried to stop him to ask what happened. And all he said was, car bomb, car bomb, and then I, I couldn't press him for any more information. He said, when that last bomb went or when that last collapse happened and they when the first tower collapsed it was a massive explosion when that explosion occurs it was like the scene out of a horror film another explosion a rolling blast of fire a rolling column of fire towards us you saw people being wheeled on gurneys away from the site of the explosion i looked up and that's when i heard the <laughs> pardon me that's when I heard the explosion. That's when the second tower came down. I there was, uh, it was an explosion. Two or three minutes ago, there was yet another uh, collapse or explosion. I'm, but at a quarter to 11, there was another collapse or explosion following the 1030 collapse of the second tower. I saw the uh, explosion and, and also the, the collapse of the tower. I'm with subsequent explosions. And, and uh, explosions were coming down the building. It looked as if charges had been set on each floor and they were in succession going off. He received word of the possibility of a secondary device, that is another bomb going off. Uh, he tried to get his men out as quickly as he could, but he said that there was another explosion which took place. And then an hour after the first hit here, with the first crash that took place, he said, uh, there was a, another explosion that took place uh, in one of the towers here. Uh, so obviously, he, according to his theory, he thinks that there were actually devices that were planted in the building. But the bottom line is that according to the chief of safety of the New York City Fire Department, he says that he probably lost a great many men in those secondary explosions. It put us about a block and a half away from uh, the site of where the explosion was. So their fear is that there may have been explosive devices planted either in the building or in the adjacent area. Office supplies many, many blocks from the site of the actual explosion where they now... I was actually in the subway heading towards the World Trade Center right around Franklin Street. And after the first explosion, the subway station started to fill with smoke. The subway cars started to fill with smoke and the subways actually stopped. And I was walking on Broadway at Fullerton and suddenly we heard an explosion. It was the first tower coming down. I started to walk out. I walked down Broadway towards Canal and we heard the second a second explosion. Covered in the debris and the dust from from the explosion itself. I was it was rocked with a lot of the explosion from the force of the twin of the uh, twin World Trade Centers when they came down. I was out front as you were when the second explosion occurred because the explosion through debris on top of a lot of people that was when the real panic began sequence of crashes then explosions and then the collapses this must have been ground zero where this thing blew up car after car after car buses completely obliterated and burned straight down to the steel now that's the first time we're hearing that so two planes and explosives that were in the building is that correct that is the working theory at this point the first wave of rescue workers who went in were trapped many of them killed by the second blast and escaped through the lobby where they report they believe there was a bomb in the lobby i believe the, the bomb hit the lobby first and a couple of seconds in the first plane hit
Okay. Thank you for showing that. Um, I have this little fantasy of a, of a little kid walking along with his mother and the guy, the little boy says, Mom, why did so many people at uh, the World Trade Center on 9-11 say that they saw and heard explosions when the buildings come down? And his mother says, well, Johnny, I guess the simplest hypothesis is that they saw and heard them because there were explosions at the time the buildings came down. I know that's a silly fantasy. Uh, in reality, we know that Johnny and his mom would both be dismissed as conspiracy theorists. In fact, let me pause for a moment. Uh, I have heard so many times people say that it was obvious to people on the scene that the buildings came down because they were hit by planes, you know, and they were damaged and down they came. And it wasn't until a bunch of knuckle-dragging conspiracy nuts came around that anybody came up with this idea of explosions. Well, that's just not just wrong, it's provably wrong. And that's, that's what I'll say in the first part of my talk here. So here's what Ted Walter and I decided to do. We, we, there were already uh, a lot of little videos on the internet showing that there were reporters who had witnessed explosions, but we wanted to be more systematic, more scientific, we wanted to make sure we didn't think, take things out of context. We wanted to make sure we didn't cherry pick our evidence, just choosing, in other words, if p reporters that said what we wanted them to say. So we studied as many continuous hours of US TV footage as we could find. It came to slightly over 70 hours from 11 sources. And the result was pretty clear. 84% of the reporters who witnessed personally the destruction of the towers mentioned explosions, 84%. Was that uh, surprising to us? No, it wasn't. 15 years ago, I studied 10,000 pages of the World Trade Center Task Force report to see what the firefighter members of the FDNY experienced on 9-11, and I found 92% of those who uh, directly witnessed the explosions, sorry, the destruction of the towers spoke of explosions. So somewhere between 84% and 2 and 92% of the people who were there on the day at the scene of the World Trade Center destruction talked about explosions and explosive destruction. So that was the overwhelmingly dominant hypothesis leading of course to the question how did it become displaced? I want to say briefly one other word here. I know there will some, be some people who will say, well, of course, there are going to be explosions in any high-rise fire. It doesn't prove anything. Uh, although I don't have time to make the case here, I've made it elsewhere. It's not too difficult to make. Uh, no, the kinds of explosions you would expect in a high-rise fire, everything from smoke explosions and electrical explosions and natural gas explosions, so-called jet fuel explosions, um, blevies and so on, could not rip the buildings apart, which is what many people saw happening. If there were explosions taking the buildings apart, it was only, it could only be pre-planted explosives. And if there were pre-planted explosives, the entire mainstream story of 9-11 is radically false and the global war on terror is a radical fraud. So that was the answer to our first question. The first question Ted and I asked, um, how many people, what percentage of reporters talked of explosions? 84%. Now, the second question was a little bit more difficult. And um, it's taken us more time to write this up. It's not published yet. But I'll, I'll give you an idea of, of what we came up with, because I think it's important for everybody, not just those who are studying the events of 20 years ago, but those who are studying the deep state events that we're going through right now. So uh, second question then was, if so many people, so many reporters on the ground clearly perceived explosions destroying the buildings, what happened to that hypothesis? Because we found that it was displaced very quickly. And that by the end of the day, the day of 9-11, almost all, as far as I can remember, almost all, of the networks and stations assumed 
that a structural failure hypothesis was correct. That is, that some bad guys had smashed planes into the buildings, it had weakened the buildings, and they had come down. They didn't necessarily call it the structural failure hypothesis, but that was what they assumed. Well, um, we found that there were two main strategies, and now we're entering into the area of propaganda studies. We're entering into the question of how did the planners of this event manage to establish their absurd and false hypothesis in the face of overwhelming eyewitness evidence to the contrary. I want to begin by saying that some news anchors were actually doing their job on 9-11, but they quickly realized that there was such a thing as an explosion hypothesis, that it wasn't the same as a structural uh, failure hypothesis, and they were trying to figure out which one was right. Here are examples. CNN's anchor Aaron Brown at 10.53 a.m. Quote, it collapsed in a cascade of smoke and spark, and what we cannot tell you is if there was a second explosion that caused that collapse. Then shortly after that, just as the smoke was starting to clear away, the second tower, it almost looks like one of those implosions of buildings that you see, except there is nothing controlled about this, end of quote. You notice how Brown comes right to the brink of the unspeakable. It almost looks like, and then it's too scary, he steps back, but there's nothing controlled about this. Nonetheless, Brown realized there were two different hypotheses, hypotheses on the go, and he kept asking his reporters in the field uh, whether they had perceived explosions or not. Here's another uh, sincere news anchor, CNBC's news, news anchor Mark Haynes, who said at 10.21 a.m., quote, but here you see an enormous explosion about midway up in the South Tower, and the entire structure collapses. It just disappears. Now that's interesting from a forensic point of view. The explosion that leveled the South Tower came, it seemed, roughly halfway, halfway up, and yet it took the entire tower out." End of quote. Okay, so there were some sincere news anchors trying to do their job, so what happened? How did they get silenced? How did they all become convinced of the structural failure hypothesis. I think there are two main uh, techniques that were employed. The first is the use of fake expertise. Uh, this is not very difficult to uh, understand. So, for example, CNN found itself with a visit from engineer, uh, an engineer called De Stefano, who explained with great confidence that it was structural failure that caused the buildings to come down. CNBC, whom I quoted a moment ago, got a visit from an engineer by the name of Gas, who also explained conf confidently that it was st structural failure. Now, I, I want to make clear that I have no problem with anybody, engineer or otherwise, going on TV and giving their theory about what might have happened. But for them to confidently say, this is what happened, thereby excluding another hypothesis. At that point in the day, at that point in history, was absurd. And that's why I call it fake expertise. What evidence did they have? Photographic evidence? No. Video evidence? No. Had they studied the dust? Had they studied the steel? Had they assembled the eyewitnesses? Did they have thermal or seismic evidence? They had nothing. So they had no business making these confident statements, and yet they seem to have been effective. As far as I can tell, both CNN and CNBC closed down their explosion hypothesis at that point. The second strategy or technique that was employed is ultimately even more important, I think, and it's, it's indirect and perhaps not quite as obvious. I'm going to describe it this way. Name the designated perpetrator, tell a frightening story about this perpetrator, and repeat these, meaning the name of the perpetrator and the story, endlessly. Now, in this case, the designated perpetrator is Osama bin Laden. So you will construct a story about him, which is scary. You know, he's evil, he hates the United States, and so on. It becomes quite an elaborate story, and it's gradually built up during the day of 
And you will also get his name out there as quickly as possible and repeat it again and again so that there really is no other suspect by the end of the day. I don't have time today in this presentation to give examples of the building of the story. This is the story of the alien force that comes from abroad, attacks innocent people so that they have to then defend themselves. This is as old as humanity, this story. The people that chose this story knew what they were doing. It's very powerful. It scares people. It tells them to throw themselves into the arms of their leaders and surrender their civil rights and so on. That is a very ancient story. Brilliantly done. We don't have time to show how it was done, so I'm going to go to the uh, more simple issue of getting Osama bin Laden's name out there and repeating it. Fox News, uh, as far as I can tell, beat everybody else to the punch. Anchored John Scott named Osama bin Laden about 40 seconds after the second building was hit by a plane. And thereafter, his name becomes mentioned more and more and again and again and again. Um, CNN, to take another major news network, was a bit slower off uh, off the, the mark. But once they got going, they did the same thing. And we've, Ted and I have counted the number of discussions of Osama bin Laden. And even I've even estimated how many discussions per hour and so on. But I don't need to tell you any of that here. I just want to give you a couple of examples of what it means to mention his name and to get that repeated. So I'll give you three very brief examples from each of these two networks. First, from Fox News, Bill Richardson, former UN ambassador, quote, it looks like the work of Osama bin Laden, unquote. Next, Rita Cosby, Fox journalist, quote, John, I've been talking to intelligence sources, and the last thing that they said to me was all signs are strongly pointing to Osama bin Laden, unquote. The third, from Fox News, Alexander Haig, quote, We also know that bin Laden has made it very clear that this is a war against the United States and Israel, and we should take action accordingly, unquote. And now three brief ones from CNN. First, General Wesley Clark, quote, There's only one group that has ever indicated that it has this kind of ability, and that's Osama bin Laden's, unquote. Notice how uh, General Clark uh, avoids mentioning the agencies of the United States government, which had far more of this kind of ability than Osama bin Laden's little crew ever did. Next, Senator Orrin Hatch. The intelligence community has come to the conclusion that, look, this looks like the signature of Osama bin Laden, unquote. And finally, news anchor Judy Woodruff, quote, I can report that sources are telling CNN's national security correspondent, David Ensor, that there are, quote, good indications, unquote, that people with links to the Osama bin Laden organization are responsible for today's attacks, unquote. I think you get the idea. What I would like to do now is actually rather quickly uh, sum up by by reminding us of one aspect of what I've just told you, which I think has implications for all of us, both those of us studying 9-11 and the anthrax attacks, and those who are currently studying our present deep state operation. Um, it, I recall um, a senior academic at my university, a very wise man who has since passed on, saying to me some years ago, Graham, I was very surprised to hear you say you didn't believe the official story of 9-11. So I took the time to look into it and was surprised to find that you're right. However, I don't think you're ever going to win this contest until you have as gripping a story as your opponents. They're talking about suicide hijackers and evil Osama bin Ladens, and here you're talking about a few eyewitnesses, nanothermite in the dust, and so on. You never win that way. Where's your story? I thought about it a lot. Of course, I wasn't interested in a fictional, fictional story, nor was he. And it finally occurred to me that our true story is, is very gripping indeed. It's a story of treachery. It's a story of treason. It's a story of betrayal whereby 
astonishingly brazen and cold-hearted people kill thousands of their own citizens in broad daylight on the streets of New York, and then are heartless enough to launch wars of aggression against people in foreign countries, to uproot them by the million, to cause them grief, lamentation, and despair, all on the basis of a lie, because they had absolutely nothing to do with the events of 9-11. Now that's a gripping story, and it's a true story. It's also rather bitter and dark, so let me add this. The story is not over yet. It's up to us, it seems to me, to construct a humane ending to this story, an ending which has justice and truth in it. That's our job, and let's do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Graham. That was uh, very inspirational. And Graham, uh, some of the exhibits we have is identifying uh, the uh, people that heard the bombs going off in the uh, the exhibits we have, I think it was 123 firemen or something like that, or 155 first responders. And it was Graham McQueen that actually created that document, which is part of the grand jury petition to get a grand jury and get that evidence before the court. So, Graham, thank you for all the work you've done and thank you for this marvelous presentation. And excuse me for not getting you in on time. That's okay. That's okay, Dave. Bye bye. Bye bye. Take care.